So welcome everybody to uh, tonight's presentation, Girls to the Rescue, The Impact of World War I on Girls series books. Um, my name is Matt. I'm the head of reference and adult services at the Moffitt Library of Washingtonville. Um, this is part of a multi-part series of local history lectures um, that are either uh, focused on our regional history or features people who uh, are local uh, students or scholars, teachers of history and uh gives wants to and it's really here to kind of share their work uh with our community um i will say that this series throughout the year is is dedicated to our uh, late village historian linda j standish who recently passed away back in january um who she was a very she was a big advocate of uh, really kind of preserving our history, sharing her research with other people, and uh, really kind of in, in creating this, this wonderful environment where people came together to learn about their past. Um, just uh, to get a couple other things quickly out of the way, we do have two more programs lined up in this quarter. The uh, next one is going to be um, May 25th. It's a Thursday at, uh, oh, sorry, May 26th um, at uh, 7 p.m. It's going to be on, um, it's, it's called the After the Fashion of His People. And it's about the experience of, experiences of uh, people from Asia who came to either North America or Europe during the time of the American Revolution. And that's with historian J Daniel J. Say. And then we also have a presentation in June on uh, Washingtonville during the Gilded Age. And that's going to be um, Tuesday, June 7th at um, 6.30 with Dr. Richard Hull. Um, those are both available on our website, moffittlibrary.org, and you can register for those uh, tonight. Um, but tonight's presentation is, is presented by uh, Susan Lewis, a former professor at uh, SUNY New Paltz. And as she's said, he has worked with many students and touched many lives, um, many of whom are working in the field, others who are not, but have all been really, uh, you know, blessed in a way to, to be with her, with her knowledge and at least with memories of her classes. So with that, I'll leave that to you, Susan. Hello, everybody. I'm feeling a little more relaxed. You know, I was feeling very rusty because of, you know, the virtual world that we're in. But uh, since I know all three of you quite well, I'm feeling that I can just move ahead. I feel so there's nothing a historian likes better than talking about her own work, right? <laughs> There's nothing better in the world. But let's let me make I make an argument actually in this. I, I'm sharing facts and interpretations, but I'm making an argument. And I'll tell you right now, the argument is that the girls' books published during World War I are more feminist than Nancy Drew. And I'm not sure why they've been forgotten, but I'll interest, be interested to see if you think I've proved my case or not. So, Girls to the Rescue, I made up this name. It turns out everybody else has used it for a million years, but I still like it. The Impact of World War I on Girls series books. So, oh, that's not working. Ah, there we go. I had a co-author for this book, thank goodness, Emily Hamilton Honey, who teaches at SUNY Potsdam. She had already been working in this field. And I picked up this field when I'd been working on business women for 20 years. And I realized I wanted to do something with stories. I wanted to do something where I could read and didn't have to go to an archive. And uh, I read stories because I've always loved that. That's why I love history. So they changed the subtitle to Young Heroines in American Series Fiction of World War I, which I thought was sort of clunky, but what could I do? Okay, originally I wanted to do a big project where I'd go from Little Women to Nancy Drew and talk about the books series in between and because I felt that they had been neglected and also mischaracterized and it was like everything before Nancy Drew was somehow old-fashioned and of course Little Women was old-fashioned and people 
just dismiss them without even knowing anything about them, I felt. So this was my original plan. But <laughs> there was a librarian at SUNY Albany, a reference librarian who specialized in children's books, young adults too. And um, he said, you really should start with something smaller. That, you know, that's just such a huge project. Meanwhile, I met Emily at a popular history conference and she had already written the book. Like her dissertation was the book that I was thinking of writing. So no need to write that book. But we decided to start a book focused on World War I, that particular period. And 10 years later, our book was finished. First of all, there was far more material than we had ever imagined, as you'll see. And we were both teaching full time and living four plus hours apart. So twice a year, maybe we would be able to get together, but it was quite a long project. It was interesting though, because it was interdisciplinary. So Emily is a literature person who really focuses on this close reading of the books, which I would find so tedious. Yes, I read the books closely, but to have to describe them again to me would just, I just don't get that. But uh, I was more analytical, doing comparisons, and so we made a good team. Okay, so previous to this whole project, I had read two series from the years between 1868 and 1930. And the first, I think you will recognize, Anne of Green Gables, which, you know, I, I don't, I can't see Nancy Gill, but, you know, many girls of my age read Anne of Green Gables. What was interesting to me was, if you see here on the left, that's the original picture on the cover. And she looks so sophisticated and adult compared to the Anne of Green Gables we think of with the carroty braids. And she's about 11 years old and, you know, it's been on television. Uh, so it's still a very popular story, but I'm not sure how many people read the original and how many people are watching television. The other series I read was called Patty Fairfield. And this I did not read all 17 books, but I read these because my mother had a big box full of these books. I think they must have belonged to my grandmother or maybe her sister. And so in the summer, I'd pull them out. And you can see here Patty Fairfield, who's a very typical heroine of the pre-World War I period. And then over the years, the new covers. So obviously she's still quite popular in the 30s because this is a kind of 30s haircut and, and uh, collar. But because these books are out of copyright, they've been reissued with these very strange covers. <laughs> and, and it's interesting to me, they're free to produce, but uh, we see here, Patty Fairfield looking like a pre-Raphaelite princess. And in the other one, she looks like a disgruntled uh, John Singer sergeant. So both of these series actually did include World War I volumes. And you see here the reprinted Patty Bride, which was the last of that series, and Rilla of Ingleside, which is the last of the Anne of Green Gables series. I would say that in both of these books, World War I is going on, but the impact on these two girls is just, it, it's, it doesn't change their lives dramatically. In Patty Bride, obviously she gets married and she helps her husband by hiding a secret letter. She doesn't really risk very much. And otherwise, she's busy shopping, eating, and entertaining. In Rilla of Ingleside, the war, this is, so this is in Canada, and the war has a bigger impact on her because her brother is killed and the man she's interested in is overseas. So she suffers a lot of heartache. But it seems like the worst thing that happens to her, she makes a promise to herself not to buy a new hat. She's decided she's be too frivolous. So she's not going to buy a new hat until the world war is over. And in the end, the war is over and she kicks the hat across the room. 
So, you know, you really wonder how serious is the impact of the war on her. But I have to say that these two plots were not typical of most great war series and definitely not of the ones that were written during the war. And they actually didn't even re reflect the scope of real girls engagement in the war. This is something that we had to look at because we had to see, well, you know, these are the stories. What were real girls doing? This is actually a poster from World War I every girl pulling for victory. And it turns out that during World War I, girls were definitely elicited to do not factory work, but not just knitting either. They were called upon particularly to save food and conserve energy and to really be contributing on the home front, have victory gardens, even though they were teenagers. That's another talk for another day. I could talk to you easily for an hour about what girls actually did in World War I, but that's not what we're looking at here. So when we began working on this, we discovered that there were 59 individual books about girls in World War I that were part of series. There were 20 series that involved books about World War I. There were 21 authors. You might ask, how could there be 20 series and 21 authors? And that's because some of these were produced by syndicates. So you have the same series, but there are different authors writing the books in the series and under pe a pen name. So. For instance, Carolyn Keene wrote Nancy Drew, but there is no Carolyn Keene. There were several Carolyn Keenes. And these books were published over a five year period between 1916 and 1921. So that's a lot of books. And we read every single one, but we did divide them. I read half and Emily read half. So these are some of my favorite World War I series. The one in the middle, the Somewhere series, my absolute favorite. The Khaki Girls of the Motor Corps was Emily's favorite, I think. And the Red Cross Girls is a very interesting series because even though there are 10 books about nursing in World War I, they really are much more interested, Vandercook always her books, are much more interested in interpersonal relationships. And they sort of remind me of, Ladies Home Journal used to have, used to have a, um, a column called can this marriage be saved and this is this <laughs> i always felt like can this marriage be saved is, is the theme of many of these books but they are set nursing in world war one uh, my other favorite series was the captain lucy series written by a woman who never wrote anything else she just wrote this one four book series and then the campfire girls do their bit i love that book and there were also a lot of Campfire Girls uh, books in World War I by Vandercook. So I wanna start by comparing the way that girls are shown in World War I to Little Women. So hopefully all three of you have read Little Women at some point or at least seen the movies. So when you think about Little Women, it's just on the home front and the girls don't go and risk their lives. It's really a story of character development, much more than a story of action. And although Joe is a rebellious tomboy, right? And she is ambitious to be a writer. There's really no general discussion of women's place, their rights and roles. This has actually been injected in contemporary films. It is not there in the book. You know, uh, Joe's mother, uh, Mrs. March is not a suffragette. I'm sorry. Uh, in comparison, World War I series books focus on the battlefront. They include ambulance driving, delivering messages, and even using weapons, which really surprised me. Their stories of action, and actually, some of the heroes, not, uh, the heroines, not all of them, even start out as being perfect and omnicompetent. It's like they can just do anything and everything. There is in these books, a discussion not only of women's rights, 
and sometimes suffrage, but really of girls' place in society and their role in the war. So many of these books start off with the girls basically saying, I want to make a contribution. There's nothing I can do. I'm so frustrated. I'm so unhappy. If only I could be a soldier. If only I could be with my brother. Uh, very, very, and, and recognizing the limitations placed on girls at this moment. Now, there were tons of girl series before World War I. This was a very popular, in fact, there were more series books than just single books. And you can see here the outdoor girls, there were the motor girls, uh, there were, you know, a lot about camping and campfire girls. The girls went to college, they made movies, you know, they were actually quite active, progressive uh, heroines. So all of these girls, even before World War I, they're active and athletic. They're heroic and courageous when necessary. They solve mysteries. They travel, they have adventures. They go to high school and some of them go to college. They do care about their looks, fashion and hairstyles. Okay, so that's sort of similar to Nancy Drew. They practice organizing groups and entertaining. They have friends and boyfriends. And actually the thing about the boyfriends is interesting is that instead of them chasing boys, it's like these men are trying to court them and they are not really interested in settling down. You know, they, they're fairly fussy about who they're going to be with. There's much more bonding between women than there is competition between women. And actually, this is historically true of all books and uh, actually supposedly, according to F. Scott Fitzgerald, uh, real life, that the girls in the progressive period before World War I are really congenial and sororal, whereas the girls after in the 1920s become competitive over men. I would say that all of these women were upper middle class uh, and in contrast to little women, there's no discussion of religion. Right. So it's like somewhat time between 1868 and 1900 religion just drops out of girl series books. Now, this is why the Somewhere series is my favorite. All of them are described as being around a central figure, half girl, half boy, and the better half of each. This is the model of heroin that they've got, uh, starting with Missy, who lives on a farm in Wyoming, and we'll be meeting her again later, and uh, can ride, can shoot, can lasso, you know, can do anything that her brother can do. So when we decided how to organize Girls to the Rescue, a typical book about girl series, all the books about girl series books, is like they would be divided by series. So you'd have one chapter on the Red Cross Girls, one chapter on the Somewhere series, blah, blah, blah. And I really didn't want to do that. I was interested in comparing these series and coming up with some conclusions and not just describing each one and then having the conclusion in the end. When I have students do a paper, I was the same. You know, you don't just report, 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 analyze. The analysis should be built in. So as you can see, uh, we had a chapter about preparedness and then divided into the book is divided into what kind of activities are the girls involved in. Now, sometimes people want to know, what are you talking about with girls? Who are these girls? What makes somebody a girl? In the books, heroines ranged in age from 14 to their late 20s. This may seem strange to us. We wouldn't call a woman in her late 20s a girl, but even in the newspapers, they were the, you know, the hello girls who answered phones. And there were Salvation Army girls who were graduated from college who were handing out donuts. And my own grandmother told me that when she was growing up and she was born in 1902, there was something at her church called the Girls Friendly that included all unmarried women. 
You know, she said they were in their 70s and they're still in the girls friendly. I would say, though, that all of the books are intended for a girl's audience. You know, that's their audience. So that's what makes them girl series books, not just that they're girl heroines, but that girls will be reading them. So before U.S. entry into the war, uh, there still are books about World War I. Fewer, but there are some. Little Princess of the Stars and Stripes. This is such a funny book. In the beginning, the girls decide that they want to be more patriotic and they're going to find a way to contribute. Uh, so they decide that the way they'll do that is beautifying their town and raising local taste. They become flower doctors. And in this book, there are just as many boys as girls and they're helping the girls. The girls just boss them around and tell them what to do. And then the boys do what they say. Uh, and the only thing that they do that seems extremely productive from our viewpoint is they do raise some money for war relief. In another series, Polly Sees the World at War, uh, Polly and her friend are traveling to Europe. I would say in all of these books, the characters are immediately partisan, right? They're immediately on the side of the allies. They're never on the side of the Germans. They hate the Germans from the very beginning. And in fact, if they see some shifty character, they're sure he's German immediately. They have no doubt. Uh, they then go back to England and they're sympathetic and they're making bandages and one of them helps uncover a spy. Uh, and then romance results for Lois and she becomes engaged to a soldier. After U.S. entry, there are a lot more books, obviously, and there are some with expected roles. So we would expect, I think, helping on the home front and nursing, those two things. So activities on the home front included forming groups like the Liberty Girls and the Campfire Girls did this. They would dress up in uniforms and this in real in real life they did this too and then they would practice parading and they would get someone to show them how to do military drill uh, or they would hike and go camping uh, so that's something that happened in real life and in the books they also conserve food they plant victory gardens and in one of the books they actually farm which is hard work it's Unusual that there's hard work in these books, by the way. You know, it's like, you know, even though many things in life are hard work, that's not what these books are about. Uh, they run hostess houses where they welcome and entertain the troops and give them snacks. But the most common things that the girls do is raise money. They raise money for the Red Cross and they may raise money for Liberty Bonds. And for the Red Cross, they put on these plays, these spectacles, these parades. It one, one of them produces propaganda films because she'd been a filmmaker before the war. And Liberty Bond campaigns. This is a huge, huge thing that girls did actually during the war and in these books. And they really are quite obnoxious in, in, their, in their forcing people to give money to Liberty Bonds and accuse them of being unpatriotic if they won't do it and accuse them of not giving enough and keep bothering them. I would say that in all these books, most of the girls reject or at least dislike knitting, sewing, or making bandages. They say these things are boring and they're not enough to help with the war effort if they don't give them enough satisfaction. This picture is from Mary Louise and the Liberty Girls. And you see him here marching with an American flag in this town of Dorfield, which is supposedly in Ohio. And this is something that girls did in real life, but it's something I think even more that happens in the books and sort of heroizes these girls. You know, and, and you can see there's red, white, and blue costumes with the stars and the stripes and people watching them. Because one of the things that these books do is make these girls the center of attention, right? They're not just helping they become the center of attention. Now, girls who nurse and do relief work, again, we'd expect this. 
But the emphasis in these books is actually not nursing at home, it's nursing abroad, which did happen, but didn't happen with girls and, you know, young girls and was more rare than you would imagine. So the Red Cross girls, they nurse with the British army, the French army, they go to Belgium, they go to Russia, they go to Italy, they nurse American soldiers, they nurse on a troop ship, they nurse with Marines, they go into Germany, and they end with invalid soldiers in Washington, D.C. So they have a big scope for their nursing. And I could also say that nursing is a small part of these books, because these were the ones that I said were all about romance. In one of the Campfire Girl series and in the Captain, Captain Lucy series, these girls uh, devote themselves to relief work in France. And I hadn't realized, stupidly, I guess, how devastated France was during and after World War I, how the Germans actually destroyed uh, settlements and took all the food and left the people destitute. And in real life, as in these books, American college girls went over and helped try to rehabilitate. They fed civilians, they set up orphanages. Um, and in the books, not in real life, as far as I know, uh, these girls who are trying to help are in danger and sometimes they're even captured by a German counterattack. So for instance, Captain Lucy, who's 14 years old, I think she turns 15, goes to France to be with her father, but then um, the, the, it's a newly liberated town and the Germans counterattack and she's captured. Okay, so what are the less expected activities? Some of them are the home front, but most of them are abroad. So we have girls who drive and fly. The khaki girls, Joan and Valerie, who insist on becoming members of the Motor Corps. In fact, when they first meet at a party, Joan, who's 17 or 18, says to Valerie, who's a little bit older, I'm a motor fiend and proud of it. I wish I were a boy so I could go fight in France. Uh, they're mechanics as well as drivers, so they can fix cars as well as drive them. And they start in the US and after much parental objection, they go to Europe. And when Joan's father is trying to convince her not to join the ambulance corps, he gets a friend who's just come back from Europe who tells a story about a young American girl who goes to drive an ambulance and she's immediately injured and blinded. So this is to get Joan to back off. And Joan says something like, well, she made her choice and she had her chance. <laughs> so she did not dissuade it at all. In Somewhere in England, Alice Blythe actually drives and flies. She learns to fly secretly with her cousin giving her lessons. And then she wheedles her way against parental objections into France. She accidentally, which is very big in these books, by the way, the accidents, uh, comes upon an ambulance where the driver is injured. So she says, I can drive this ambulance. And she gets in the ambulance. And then she finds a plane with a wounded pilot. So she says, I can fly this plane. And uh, because he says he has this vital observation and information that has to be um, delivered to headquarters. So here you see a, a, a picture from the khaki girls gritting her teeth. Joan drives the ambulance forward. As you can see, the ambulance would be under fire. And in one episode, Joan and Valerie joke about being caught under their ambulance during an air raid. One of them says, I'm glad to see I have a jaw left. And the other one says, Bunky, we are going to have a very busy time. And these, of course, are the kinds of things that men say in battle, you know, fooling around. But you didn't necessarily expect to find them in girls' books. This picture, I have the whole thing on the left and the close-up on the right, shows Alice Blythe, after she delivers the, she, she sort of crashes the plane when she delivers the message, and she um, ends up with a broken ankle. 
but nevertheless, you know, she, she has forced her way into the war. So the most surprising things that girls do in these books mostly happen abroad. There's not that much that happens that's surprising at home. Joan and Valerie, actually, while they're still home, apprehend a German saboteur uh, and are greatly admired. But in the following volumes, they expose a clever and beautiful German spy known as the Crossroads Princess, who everybody else trusts, but Joan immediately has a sense that she's no good. In the first volume of the Somewhere series, uh, the heroine who's in Wyoming uncovers a horse rustling ring that nobody else suspects. This ring is selling horses to the German. They, the Germans, they take horses that have been bought by the allies, steal them and sell them to the Germans and then send inferior horses to the allies. So she discovers this, um, nobody else suspects it. And then later she actually stops a train that's about to travel over a sabotage bridge. And she does this by sending a lasso across the train, which doesn't stop it, but it pulls out the mile marker, which then alerts the uh, engineer that something's wrong. So she saves uh, an entire train load of soldiers, including her brother and her love interest from dying on this bridge. In Captain Lucy and her flying ace, the heroine, <clears throat> in this case, aged 15, helps to uncover a German spy and saboteur <clears throat> who's like a German soldier who's imprisoned uh, by the Allies, but manages to get out and start sabotaging and uh, sharing information about the Allied positions. And she is very instrumental in getting rid of him. Now, this girls who rescue men. This is so common. And I should say that in these books, girls often do more than one thing. It's not like they just rescue men, or they just find spies and saboteurs, or they, they just nurse. They, they could do all three, four, five things. Uh, but this is ubiquitous in these, in these books. Absolutely the most common thing. So the opposite of being damsels in distress, which I think we would suspect would be true in the early 20th century, they throw off the shackles of gender expectations very deliberately. And they save their fathers, brothers, love interests, and other soldiers, including officers, through their efforts. In one book, even on the home front, one of the campfire girls, whose name is Sawa, these campfire girls have the strangest names. Absolutely. In any case, she's a campfire girl who saves a drowning U.S. pilot. He had been on his way to some kind of fake battle or aerial, um, you know, activity. Uh, he's, it's, so it's not overseas. The, this book, starts with one of the most passionate complaints about how girls aren't given anything to do in the war. On the other hand, strangely enough, the pilot she's rescuing, who she does not know, is already in love with her because he once saw her on a train. <laughs> the very train where she was complaining about how girls didn't get to do anything. And you see here her pulling him out of the swamp. Uh, so going back to Missy, the one who found the cattle rustling, I mean the horse rustling, after she discovers the ring, her, all her male relatives decide to go out in search of Thud Sheldon, who's the villain. Love that name. So they all go searching for Thud Sheldon, and she goes, she's so angry, so she goes out on her horse, and by accident, she stumbles upon Thud Sheldon and his accomplice who are about to roll one of the, ha the, 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 the cow hands from her father's ranch over this cliff. And you can see that right here. 
and she saves him by, by drawing her pistol and speaking these words, not today, Mr. Sheldon. And you can see her here with, you know, the, the girl and the pistol and the guys. Um, and he found himself looking into the muzzle of Missy's gun. In Belgium, uh, Marie Kinderbrun, she's so interesting because she's 14 and 15. She's running an, uh, an in single-handedly, but physically she's like, remember um, Belgium was always poor little Belgium. So she's like poor little Belgium in the shape of a girl. She twice crosses enemy lines to deliver a message at night. She hides the identity of a British soldier oh, pretending to be German. And my favorite part, she single-handedly digs a tunnel through which the British captives can eventually escape. So she saves a whole group of men through her basically single-handed efforts. In Italy, this is also the Somewhere series, Lucia Rudini. She's a 14-year-old orphaned goat herd in a northern Italian town, which is under attack by the Austrians. You see here how she rescues a wounded officer and uses her goat to pull him to safety on a makeshift pallet, which I believe she makes out of the door of her hut that she lives in. Uh, she also spies, she is captured, she escapes, and of all the girl heroines, she is the most bloodthirsty. She actually has a line in the beginning that says, you know, I cannot love, I can only hate. So just the opposite of the sweet kind of heroine you might expect in a book of this period. <laughs> and finally, we have girls who fight. These are girls who actually engage in some type of combat. You know, they spy. They don't just reveal spies. They actually spy. They hold the spies at gunpoint. Sometimes they shoot the spies. Uh, Valerie Duval of France kills Germans with a pistol and then mans a machine gun to mow down an advancing column of men. Lucia Rudini blows up a bridge. Several of them deliver important messages across a battlefield and through enemy lines. Captain Lucy flies as a gunner in a plane over Germany. And this is so common in these books. It's not like they do this and then go back to modesty. They are, you know, the, 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 the king of Italy gives, gives, gives Lucia Rudini a, a medal. The, um, Lu, Valerie Duval runs a, runs a croix de guerre. You know, there are parades in their honor. Everybody knows how important they were. Oh, and this is the picture of Valerie Duval with her pistol because she is in this basically ruined building and the allied soldier has the machine gun, but some Germans come in. So she shoots them. And then when the allied officer is wounded, she takes over the machine gun and starts firing. In Captain Lucy's flying ace, she disguises herself as a gunner to assist her brother. The actual gunner, who is a flying ace, the actual gunner was, um, you know, hurt by the saboteur who she later uncovers. And so they go to rescue an old family friend who's now a prisoner in Germany. I would say that all these books have a theme of that the prisons in Germany are horrible and they're like torture and all the soldiers are sick and dying and not fed enough and ill-treated. So when they get to Germany, she has to hide all by herself in a German forest for hours in the middle of the night, but that's okay. When they get back in the plane, they're pursued and she actually fires both guns on the plane, but she doesn't know how to reload them. And it's unclear in this case whether her shots did any damage or not. And this brings up the mixed messages in these books, because except for the Somewhere series, 
mostly the girls are not violent, right? They're, they're contributing, but they're not contributing by actually shooting people. Uh, I have a talk that I gave before the book was finished called From Competent Con to Conflicted, Mixed Messages in these girls series books. And one of my theories is that this is a theme in literature for girls throughout the 20th century. Very, very big on mixed messages. So after all of these heroic adventures, which I've described to you, um, almost immediately after their climactic action, they're injured or become sick or are rescued by men, and they all return to the protection of their families or love interests. So these actions show that girls can do things, but they don't translate into any new roles in the post-war world or any new attitudes of male characters toward them. So uh, Alice Blythe can capture a saboteur and keep him as, and spy and keep him in a tower for three days. But when her boyfriend turns up, um, the guy who taught her to, to fly, uh, well, you can't come with me to, you know, in the car with him because it'd be far too dangerous. And this tends to happen in book after book. And the most, the most of you know, representative of those books is Phoebe Marshall somewhere in Canada. Phoebe Marshall is the only girl who is depressed and worried and has bad dreams. Uh, she has one brother who's been killed and the other one has disappeared. So he, she doesn't know whether he's alive or dead. And you can see here, it shows her smiling with, with bags, which is strange because she doesn't go overseas as far as you know well maybe she goes overseas to find her her brother but she certainly wasn't smiling on the right you see that she finds a wounded soldier but she saves him in the sense that she unties him from the tree but there's no dramatic action and in the end of this book uh her love interest actually says something like you know, and now I'm going to take care of her. And her brother says, and you do it so well. So let's do a contrast with Nancy Drew. I'm going to argue that these girls series books were, and I actually read the first five Nancy Drew books. Um, they were more competent. They can do more than change a tire. They can actually uh, be mechanics on the front with an ambulance. They save more people, you know, they save entire armies in battle, whereas Nancy Drew in her early books mostly saves genteel individuals who are down on their luck and are being hounded by nouveau riche people with no taste. They face far greater danger. You know, Nancy is sometimes tied up and, you know, she could be threatened, but she's not on a battlefield. They're much more patriotic and idealistic. These girls are just burning to contribute to the war and to their country. They're more ambitious than Nancy. Nancy likes solving things, and I think she likes people to recognize her, but she doesn't yearn to be recognized. She doesn't yearn to um, win the Croix de Guerre. You know, you can't imagine that. They're more feminist and rebellious against limits placed on girls. So they spend much more time complaining about the way girls are treated and fighting against it. I would say that the only thing about Nancy Drew that's somewhat feminist is that she never, ex she never, she never apologizes for being a girl. She just seems to take for granted that girls can do things. But there, of course, were still limits on girls in the 1930s, and she doesn't discuss them. The girls in these books are much less concerned about looks and fashion. In fact, these aren't described at all, hardly. So you know how in most girl series books, there's the color of the hair and the color of the eyes and what they're wearing. None of this is important once World War I starts. And 
they're a little bit less classist and racist because if you read the first five Nancy Drew books, they all are sort of involved with class and they're also incredibly anti-Semitic and they're incredibly racist where the evil characters are always Jewish, stereotypically Jewish or, or stereotypically black. So problematic about Nancy Drew, although those books I think have been rewritten. Okay, so the World War I books briefly live on into the 1920s, but in fact, after this, there are no series books based on any particular war. Five because, minutes, Susan. Sure, I'm almost done. We're, we're doing well here. Um, there are no more series books based on a particular war because the syndicates decide that then you can't sell them after the war. So it, it, it reduces sales. And certainly after World War II, all these books are forgotten. Here you see how this Somewhere series was transformed in the 1920s. On the left, Helen Carey, Somewhere in America. Why she's wearing a nursing outfit, I don't know. She did not nurse. She was the one with the gun and the, in Wyoming. But uh, this was the picture that they wanted to show of you know, the self-sacrificing American girl. On the right, same book with the color cover from the 1920s. She's been turned into a flapper. She's on an ocean liner with someone who seems to be, you know, sort of a, a you know, an older guy who's going to take care of her. And she's very beautiful and well dressed. So if anybody's interested in further reading, uh, Emily's book is Turning the Pages of American Girlhood. So this was the book I didn't have to write because Emily was already writing it. And um, this book I loved, Boys in Khaki, Girls in Print, which is about British girls and includes, there was a newspaper series called Emma Brown, where this Cockney servant actually forms and leads uh, a company of soldiers in battles in World War I. Okay, thank you all very much. I'm thanking the Moffat Library, Matt Therens, my former student, Aaron Lefkowitz, who I see here, who anytime we had a question about a battle, he was much better than an encyclopedia. He could answer any question we had succinctly and clearly in a way we could understand. So he was invaluable, though most of these books aren't about specific battles. All right, and now questions. Yeah, just, just, yeah. Aaron. Yep. Yeah. Uh, excellent presentation as always. Uh, <laughs> just a quick question. So yes. you said that there was a ton of these books written during the conflict, were any of them ever adapted into short films during the war or afterwards? No, there were films during the war and afterwards about girls being patriotic, girls on the home front. And then, what's her name? Clara Bow, one of her first, her first, um, her first films was about a young woman who goes to nurse in France to find her boyfriend. But none of these, none of these books ever became films, as far as I know. <clears throat> uh, Susan, can yes. I ask a question? I um, wish you would. I love your presentations always. They're always so interesting. And this was no exception. Um, I'm a little older than you, I think, but uh, you made the point that uh, it was unusual to see uh, women in their 20s, late 20s, referred to as girls. But you know, it wasn't until the 60s and really the 70s that it became a, a matter of consciousness not to call young women girls and even older women. And, and to this day, you know, the expression, uh, leave the message with my girl, you know, meaning my <laughs> secretary is still very common in some circles anyway. So I don't think that's so unusual. Yeah, you know, 
Naomi, I bet I'm 73. So I don't think that I'm younger than, you know, older, or younger than you. I bet we're around the same age. Um, if I'm wrong, sorry. But I'm 75. Um, so there. there yeah. So <laughs> I remember the time when somebody sometimes people ask us, you know, why are you referring to girls? Isn't that demeaning? And I said, I remember going from all women were girls, like the girls would have to go and put on their makeup. You know, the girls were going to the ladies room, put on their lipstick Two, nobody could be girls. Uh, even teenagers had to be young women, right? Mm -hmm. To the kind of reclamation of girl power in the early 21st century, where there's an attempt to like the Powerpuff Girls, you know, making girls more powerful and recognizing that, um, that maybe the word girl is okay if you're actually a girl, you know, if you're actually a teenager. But you're absolutely right. Although it wasn't as bad as women of 70 being referred to as girls usually in my in my childhood anyway. But uh, yeah. Young lady is even worse. Young lady. For an older no, woman. No, I, I really can't stand ma'am. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> that just makes thing? my blood run cold. You made the point that in the end, these young women all return to their families. Yep. Uh, you know, it, it, it's a safety and to a, a known relationship. And it makes me wonder if these books aren't a way of kind of containing the rebelliousness that uh, that was probably pretty common in, in this age group, uh, especially at a time of war and showing, you know, by using this fable where they went out and they did all these bold things and they escaped with their lives and and uh, uh, came home to the home, you know, the hearth and, and were safe. And if it's a kind of a way of, I don't know exactly how to express it, but instead of leading them into real adventures mm -hmm. where they might have lost their lives and right. uh, uh, gotten mislaid in some way, uh, it, um, it, it shows them coming safely to the end of the adventure, almost like a children's story. You know, Naomi, you are so brilliant because <laughs> many, many years ago, when I was in college, I did a comparison between a short story in Godey's Ladies Book and a short story in Red Book. So we had something from the 1860s and something from the 1960s. And both these stories had the same trajectory. In the beginning, the woman is angry, you know, she, 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 she's fighting against her fate. She doesn't want to get married. Uh, she doesn't want to end up like a woman uh, in that role. And by the end, she has become domesticated and realizes that she can be so happy, you know, just in this domestic, wifely, maternal role. So I'm sure, I'm not surprised that they, they sort of bring back and domesticate these girls, but it does surprise me what they have them do in between. And one of the things I looked at was, were there any girls who did this? And there actually were in Europe. You know, there were a few and probably more than a few, but these ones become famous there's a there's a girl who in Belgium who destroys German um, radio uh, radio equipment and then she's caught and then she escapes. There were girls who helped allied soldiers escape. And after the war, these women are well known and they actually travel around. You know, so one of them comes to the United States and is feted. But of course, American girls were not overseas that much. So one of the things that the books do is they exaggerate how easy it was for girls to go overseas. Women didn't even have that easy a time, but certainly girls of 14 or 15 are not going to be allowed to go to the front in World War I. That just is not going to happen. <laughs> so yeah. Uh, and again, you, you know, Susan Douglas talks about this in about the 60s in Where the Girls Are. 
And she talks about growing up with an incredible number of mixed messages about what girls could and couldn't do. But at one point I was going to write uh, an article called Mixed Messages from the Women's Page, looking at copies of the Albany Times Union from 1900, because it was the same thing. It was like one article would say, girls can do, women can do anything, you know, and they're undervalued. And the next one would say, if you want a man to love you, you better be able to cook. And, you know, page after page like this with these, with these amazing contradictions. So, uh, yeah, I think we had a really good time writing this book. Uh, and even probably a better time reading the books that, you know, that we had to, we had to go through. Now, I, I have a question. Uh, in, in your, in your research on these books, were you able to trace if, I mean, I'm, I guess this is, a, this is more personal interest, but were you able to trace any of these books to like specific libraries or how often they circulated in a public you know, that would be so good because that's always the key question when you're looking at popular culture. What was the reception? Mm -hmm. I have no idea how I would do that. And that would be great. I do know that one of these books had a fan letter published in a newspaper in Tennessee by a 12 year old. Mm -hmm. That's the only specific thing I ever found. Uh, but I'm thinking that they must have been somewhat successful because they were reissued. Mm -hmm. In other words, if they weren't selling, they wouldn't have been reissued in the 1920s. So the ones that are reissued in the 1920s, I think, must have been selling in some way. But if you know how to trace things through libraries, Matt, we've got to talk. <laughs> I, I, I just know that um, it, it has nothing to do with young girls, girls literature, but I do know that there is a letter in our archive that talks about, um, it's written by a young woman who's, you know, 13, 14, mm -hmm. and she went to see this movie called The Heart of Humanity, which I guess was a propaganda film, and it was about, you know, he had like the stereotypical Germans with the pickle haubs and the mm -hmm. mustaches, and she said, it's just terrible what they're doing over there, and, you know, so it just was interesting to kind of hear that perspective um, being sent to her her brother who was currently fighting overseas, um, and he kind of saw the reality of it. So that I thought was interesting to have a young a young girl's perspective on on that yeah. through movies, but not through popular literature that I found yet. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, the thing it's trying unless you accidentally find something like this, and maybe at some point where all girls' diaries are digitized and you could do a search, mm -hmm. uh, we might be able to discover what girls actually said about these books. Mm -hmm. But it's sort of needle in a haystack kind of thing. Yeah, definitely. Anybody else? Have we got anything in the chat or does we, have we ordered? Oh. So thanks so much. Bye, Naomi. And uh, yeah, great. Yeah. So uh, thank you. I'll just say thank you, Susan, for uh, presenting and everybody for attending. Um, I, and again, I'm, I'm not one to plug other people's books, but it's, it's definitely going to go on our library shelf. Um, so you'll be seeing this book shortly after it gets processed. And um, Susan, I think you're presenting at another, you're, you're presenting this again on Wednesday? Yeah, for the town historian in New Paltz. Yes. So now, now I've had a great introduction, very supportive. <laughs> and uh, I expect that in my next presentation, there may be more people I didn't know personally. Well, very good. Well, thank you all for attending. And uh, we hope to catch you at our next presentation. Bye, Aaron. We'll be in touch. Matt, we'll be in touch. Naomi, I think, was leaving. And Nancy Gill, I see you every week. Bye. Bye. <laughs>